So we are kind of what up to up to here, right? Just just this this one and two allows us to think about the body as a machine, and that's and that's knowledge that we can use regardless of of what the body type is, whether it's human or not. Um, <clears throat> Three and four, or potentially three, four, five. Let's let's say it's three and four. This is where we can think about things more in uh, like in the design sense. This is this is the idea of there being a meeting point, a consistent meeting point in nature between order and chaos. So what you will find with any uh, anything in nature, certainly any any muscle mass, is this balance between um, between order and variety, or order and chaos, however you'd want to describe that. So when you're thinking about a muscle. I would recommend thinking about it in this way, like what is the pattern that allows you to give some structure to it? And then go, okay, where does the pattern break? Because at some point it will break. And if you have, if you have a pattern without breaking it, then it's overly ordered. If you break it without a pattern or if you just have chaos, then it's unstructured. So that's, that's your balance. And the example I used in the, in the previous group uh, was, the, was the pectoralis muscle, which is like, a, well, the, the pattern of this muscle is that it's made up of these multiple triangles and that they spin around each other, right? So you get that kind of candy wrapper effect. So we have however many triangles you want to break it down into, three or four, spiral around each other. That, that's going to be information that, um, that I'm sure you guys are familiar with already. And then you go, OK, where does that pattern break? And you, you could do that in a bunch of ways. But one way that I'd recommend looking at is that top triangle tends to be the dominant one, right? There's always, there's always going to be some breaking to the rule. And like you look at this in old people, certainly. Or, or when an arm is raised like that, you can see that that portion of the pec breaking away from all of the others. Uh, you look at this in bodybuilders, and you might see what feels like a tight elastic band wrapped around the, uh, the, the top of the body there. This is a specific detail. I'm not interested in you remembering it uh, unless you want to. But it's that idea of any, any muscle that you look at will, will, have that, will have that break or will have that uh, balance. How you define it is kind of up to you. What you look for will be different to what I look for, and that's what makes us all different as artists. But, um, but so this, the PEC was a call out from one of the students in the, or one of the attendees in the other class. Um, let's, let's try it with, a, with another muscle to see, like, was there someone, someone name a muscle that either you'd want to know more about or you're just interested, or just call a muscle, I don't mind. Deltoids. Deltoids. Deltoids is an interesting one, right? Because you'd go, what the pattern of the deltoid is is fairly easy to define because it comes from the name. It's a triangular muscle. So the name, the, the Greek symbol delta, that gives us a deltoid. You're looking at the deltoid from the side, it gives you that triangle. Then you can take the pattern further because it breaks down into three separate portions, right? Three separate shapes that are all, in a way, teardrop shaped, right? Your anterior portion grabs hold of your clavicle, your medial portion grabs hold of your chromium, and your posterior portion grabs hold of uh, your scapula at the back through there. So this is a clearly defined pattern. And it's, it's actually a, a really good call out because um, this is like a lot of people stop at this point. And you end up with deltoids that are like, eh, yeah, they're, they're, they're kind of there, but they're missing that lemon juice that kicks it into life. And so then you go, OK, well, where does that break? And it, it can be in a bunch of ways, but like what I would look for is the, the, the deltoid kind of points forwards. So actually, as we have this medial portion, instead of coming directly down the arm through there, it's kind of, it's kind of pointing forwards like that, right? And then you have the posterior portion like that. And then this anterior portion is diving underneath that medial portion. So it's not coming down to a perfect point. What that gives you is like this S-curve rhythm through there. So that's... That for me is like the you know one really powerful way of breaking it. You, you can go okay, well actually this this medial portion of the deltoid is made up of like these what multi pennant fibers, basically like a like a braided muscle. That's an interesting way to break it, and you know you'd see it you'd see it on the Hulk, I guess. But um, but in life we're not seeing that so much. So one thing I'm looking for is is the fact that this is tucking underneath that, and then another thing that that you can look for is, so let's, let's look at this. Well, we're carrying looking at this from the side view. So this we're saying is our clavicle. That's our rib cage through there. This is our scapula through there, something like that. So deltoid here is bulging forwards, right? And then it's flat on the back. 
that I think if it's not something that you're looking for already, uh, is is really really helpful in figuring out the variety of the deltoid, and it's it's there for a reason. Basically, like the the humerus bone, this bone here, is looking backwards towards the scapula, right? The the articulation of the scapula is at the back, so the bone looks backwards, meaning the back of the bone bulges forwards. So the this bulge of the shoulder. And the bulge of the deltoid is created by the bone, right? This is pushing out forwards, and then you have the flatness on the back. So that, there, there you have straight away two juxtaposing ideas, right? You have the bulge through here and the flatness on the back. Um, and, and I think a natural tendency, like, for, for a lot of us is to go, instead of looking for that bulge playing off against the flatness, is just to go bulge, bulge, bulge. And then you end up with a symmetrical pattern, which is deadly, you know, in terms of in terms of making something feel natural and believable. So really, like, this, this stuff, like, um, the, these ideas, uh, you know, they're, they're concepts I'm not going to go through in detail with each of the muscles, but I'll touch on it for when we start blocking in muscles here. But it's just a, a hopefully useful thought exercise for when you're studying muscles to, to keep that in mind. Because it's like, that gives, you the, that gives you a question to ask when you go to reference. So you're not just looking at lines and copying lines anymore. You're starting to, to train a way of thinking that puts you in control of it and puts you in, in charge. Um, and, and these two points are, are pretty similarly related to that. Um, just encouraging you to think about the personality of a muscle. Like in the same way that a street uh, caricature artist would take the personality of your face and go, well, OK, your face is pretty round, your, face, your nose is pretty long, or whatever, and go, let me take that and push it. You have the same thing with, with uh, muscles with any part of the body. So like the latissimus, for example, being a very flat muscle. So I, I actually, when I'm working with the latissimus, I'm, I'm just thinking about the form that's underneath it. And if you don't think about that, then you're going to fill in the form too much, and you're going to end up with, with an effect that doesn't work. Or like, if we look at the back of the scapula through here, so let's say that's our, that's our scapula, that's the spine of our scapula through there, that's the point of articulation. Uh, the muscles through here that we're interested in, this would be teres major, this one would be infraspinatus. And the personality of the teres major is that it's rounded. Right? The personality of the infraspinatus is that it's fairly flat. So again, that's two, two ideas juxtaposing each other within a small space. And that, that allows you to, to create dynamism and contrast in the, uh, in the scapula when you're working with that. The third muscle that we have here is the teres minor. With that, I would go, it's a, it's a little small muscle that you hardly ever see. So I kind of just like put that to one side and don't worry about it. You know, like, like we always have to prioritize and the amount of time that you can spend studying and working with the form is limited. So cut out anything that isn't really going to add anything. And, you know, if you're at the point where you're worrying about the terror is minor, then you're in a pretty good point with stuff overall. So, so with this, I go, okay, not so important. With this, I go, it's like, um, what? It's, it's, it's like a cigar or something like that, right? And it's rounded. With this, I go, well, it's, it just fills in the rest of the scapula here, and it's fairly flat. So think about things in, in those terms. It could literally just be as, as little as, is the muscle fat muscle? Is it a flat muscle? Is it, um, is it a rounded muscle? So something like that, you know? But it helps, you, um, it helps you create variety across the body. You're not treating all areas the same, which is, uh, is going to give you problems. And then this idea of, does it have visible tendon, is, uh, is a fairly important one because especially when you're dealing with muscular figures because visible tendon has a similarity to um to a bony landmark right so the function of tendon is is what bone. yeah binds muscle to bone right ligaments bind bone to bone they don't impact the form well, we don't need to worry about ligaments but tendon uh basically is that the transition between the muscle and the bone so sometimes when a muscle has a visible area of tendon especially when that muscle is under tension or when that muscle is very developed, that transition from the muscle to tendon becomes very sharp and, and is something that you want to be able to grab hold of to give you uh, that variety. Because maybe, maybe through here you're working with soft forms, here's a medium form, but then through here you'll have the tendon of the trapezius and that on a big person or on a person who's working the trapezius is going to be a sudden transition. So looking out for that allows you to find that little bit of, that little bit of sharpness. And it's very useful when you're dealing with, with movement, when you're conveying motion in, in shot sculpting or, or whenever it is that you're doing that. And, um, and muscles that have visible tendon, that's really part of their personality. Like if you look at a bent leg, something like that, I can feel it there. This, this is a sharp little, um, what, like a, a sharp little pen-shaped thing. That's, that's the, the tendon of my biceps femoris. Very, very noticeable as soon as the leg bends. So the biceps femoris 
that's one of the things that's that's in my head for that. Look for the tendon of it, you know. Um, and then as we get to seven and eight, this is um, not so relevant for well, not relevant at all, I guess, when you're doing stuff in uh, just in a, in a T pose, but becomes important as soon as you're dealing with shot sculpting or CFX or anything like that. Um, in this pose, is the muscle stretched or compressed? Because as soon as you move away from like this pose or whatever the pose is, as soon as you move away from let's say a relaxed pose, like as soon as I do that even a basic motion, I will have an area of, of, of uh, my body that gets compressed, right? Like this muscle acts, this means this area gets compressed, and that means that there will be another area that gets extended. There will be that contrast between those two. And you want, it, you want to play with those two things in, um, in unison with each other. And I don't know, maybe that seems obvious, but it's not always so obvious. Like, you know, if you have a back view or something like that, or if you have a side view of, of someone and you're working with the back and they're doing stuff here, well, the muscles on the back are opposing the muscles on the front. So anything that happens through there, like as this area gets compressed, this area gets extended. How do you, what, how do you deal with an area when it's extended? How do you tell that story? Right? Well, generally, when an area gets stretched out, you can find the muscle more clearly. Because when, when areas are bunched up, you have the skin and the fat and stuff like that. So when an area is stretched out, I find the muscle more clearly, and I find the bone. When it's compressed, I look for skin and I look for fat. So straight away, you have these two opposing ideas. Just as soon as any anything you know anything moves at all, and this is um, this is a, a same sort of idea, right? When you're looking at a muscle, what is the antagonistic muscle mass? Because every muscle in the body has a muscle that does the opposite function. It ha has to, otherwise you'd get stuck in a position, right? If I had uh, like a muscle that did that, but not one that did that, then I'd have to like peel myself open each time. So with any action that you do on the body, you'll have. Uh, uh, muscle that opposes it, and as whatever you're doing at any point of motion that you're doing, those things are constantly in tension with each other. They're very important when you're dealing with motion, right? Because through here, as I bend that, this is opposing that, right? Compression, extension. And then as I do that, the opposite, compression, extension. So th those two things constantly fighting with each other, and it's not so difficult to convey that story, but just knowing that that's what you're looking for can be, can be quite a time saver or can help you problem solve things quite well. Um, so anytime when I'm dealing with muscle, those are things that I'm thinking about. So